this is, I just said, where do you want to start? And I said, why not here? This is like on my floor plan for this space, which is the beautiful grounds, as you can see, because you can see pretty much all the work from any given vantage point. But this one, I'm calling it now bricks and brick bones because, uh, because of the bricks and the bones. And uh, after living in cities for my entire adult life, I was in the country suddenly in the pandemic and this tree fell. And as I was carving, it just seemed like the first time I felt that I could draw in three dimensions, literally because the wood, it's, you know, it's malleable enough to cut into. So the thing when I, what really cracked me up about this was that here's a piece of wood, which is walnut, by the way, this was the first tree that fell that on the property was a walnut tree and they were going to chip it. And I saw the wood and I just thought it would be tragic to lose that wood. It's so beautiful. Um, so when it's newly fallen, it's still green and a little bit softer. So I was able to start working immediately. And uh, George was asking me earlier, do you make sketches for your work? And I, I never really plan ahead. I just dive in. And, and a lot of this is just like this piece in particular was part of something else. And then it was upside down and then there was a head on it and then there was something else. And then at some point I started making patterns in it and the pattern suggested the brick. And I thought it was kind of hilarious that, you know, wood is a brick and suddenly, you know, um, the bones on the other hand, these bits would be laying around the property and I would just sort of collect them and pile them up somewhere. And then suddenly they, they would kind of enter into a, another piece. And this, so this guy, uh, this thing became like a, an urban, suburban, urban rural contradiction because it's like the ruin of a city with, uh, within wood. I don't know, somehow, I don't know. It's, it suggests all kinds of things to me. So I also like the fact that it's, the color really, for me, when I was carving these, I would, I, for some reason I'd start working late in the day. And then the first time I did it, I, I just, there was this one figure that's still at her property. And I just, I suddenly thought about the spray paint and I went at it with the paint and that was like, bang, that did it. So that's kind of my process, cut, paint. <laughs> I was thinking about Marsden Hartley because I don't know if any of you know his work, but he yeah. was a, He's an American painter and he struggled a lot, but his paintings have a really beautiful heaviness to them and this kind of heavy light at the same time. And his mark making is really crude, but strong. And, and I really felt like these marks really reminded me of him. And also this thing operates like a still life really. So that's what the MH part of it is. So the mystery box for MH is for Marsden. One of the artists that I, I really admire, most sculptors and even most artists in general admire is Brancusi, of course, because of the, because of his, the work. And it's, he was the, one of the earliest people to really go full form with the abstraction. And when I started making the work, I started thinking about pedestals at some point. And his measured harmonic, pedestals have a real gorgeous like the endless column there are variations on it which are amazing you know and I just felt like I'm not Brancusi but I love that movement that he suggests with his work but my way of approaching it was kind of like to just feel my way into this notched thing and uh, so that base is kind of a thing but this piece which um, has been, it's basically a cloud shape. There's a few artists that take cloud shapes a lot. Of, it's a really beautiful simplicity to this, this stereotypical cloud. Um, there's this cartoon, Nancy, and the guy always drew three rocks. And there's a, like, why three rocks, you know? Because two is too little and four is too many and three is three rocks. Well, this is four clouds, but four puffs, you know, but it's a cloud. But anyway, I, I just, um, I had it in various configurations, but the simplicity of this is really, in the, in the end, what I just left, it's like, this is kind of its own mathematics of the square edge, and this is about the, the circle somehow. So 
right angles and curves, you know, they, they're kind of ended up there this time. <laughs> this is walnut, by the way. This is that same wood that I started with. It's just amazing stuff. And they call it chocolate because it's brown on the inside and then there's an inch of white vanilla kind of growth around the outside and then the bark. So when you cut it initially, it's just like chocolate. You just want to eat it. Mm. But you'd get a lot of splinters, so <laughs> better Where to were you it. working? Where were these trees? This was in Princeton. Um, there were some ash trees out there. So much wood. I'm going to buy a truck soon. <laughs> <laughs> My Honda Collect Element is really getting all beat to death <laughs> by all this wood. Is very hard? All of these woods are extremely oh, hard. hard. That's why it's been more important for me to cut them when they're freshly fallen. Right. Because some of them I've gone back into and I keep wondering what happened to my saw blade. Like, why is it so dull? <laughs> yeah. It's because it's practically like stone. Yeah. Right. Isn't yeah. most of these you've done with, with a chainsaw? Yeah. I did start with chainsaw, chisel, hammer, but the quickness of the chainsaw and the fact that I can, I feel like I'm drawing, I'm not, like chipping away it's like quick decisions and i i feel like i work better that way do you have different chainsaws like i used to but i'm kind of i used to love this one cheap blade but my shoulder would be killing me at the end of the night <laughs> and now i have a steel which is i bought and i thought it's too unwieldy but it has a really good shock absorber in it so now i'm not in pain after carving all day <laughs> And when you look at the front, it's another piece. And the beauty of sculpture is you can walk around it. And I mean, you don't have that with a painting. You got one view and that's it. But these things, as you can kind of sense, they, they evolve out of various processes. So I was working on different things and I started cutting. I, w I wanted to just to make an arm. And I, and I got to a certain point with these and I realized like, that's really crude, but I love the expression. And so I just stopped, you know, and then the paint came and then, you know, these other bits were sitting around, you know, I put this on top of that just to get it out of the way at some point because I was doing something else. And then I put one on top of another and, and you know, then it has its own harmony. I mean, you kind of see it after a while, things you move them around and change them and then suddenly one time it clicks and the head, the arms had been in various configurations around it and finally i just put them in there like almost like a pencil cup you know but it became kind of funny so uh they also reminded me of um like the the, the way they're crude reminded me of these Picasso like periods when he really abstracted things in the cubist work of the 30s and, and he broke up the figure in ways that I really liked and you know they kind of felt like that but then when you add I feel like the color really finishes the, the thing in the end again like the fingernail polish is just priceless it just it made the thing and and leaving the raw cuts it's like the process being revealed and the fact that this kind of rot in the wood was sealed up and closed and then I just used that pattern as a way to make the marks. I just use what's suggested in the wood and then it becomes part of the piece as a, I don't know, it's sort of like the thing is, is finding itself under the cuts and then, you know, when you put the cuts, the pattern is there and then the pattern suggests the color and it evolves that way, so. But this one is just, uh, I'm calling it well, it's sort of funny because there's the well anyway out here, but it's hard to call it anything else. And I was calling it that before, but I love this placement. At some point I had it in over the well, but it's just such a beautiful rock there that you know it kind of found its way onto that. I don't think it needs it, but it sure looks nice there. I think one of the nice things about these, this form in the back, which is in mystery box as well, is how that articulates the shape of the tree. That you've left that aspect of the of the original wood 
and in this environment sort of like echoing the the um importance of the the landscape it's it's a perfect exhibition for us for that reason oh absolutely because it highlights the the old wood that we have growing here in the the environment it's the beauty of putting these outside too because they their their shapes and the process that i'm in is so influenced by what i see around me anyway i mean i lived in the city for years and those things still come out of me but these shapes you know not correcting an asymmetrical thing and, and the fact that a circle and a, a right angle are man-made but or human-made but a natural form they, they're together they have a kind of dynamism the, the human ideal and the natural chaos or what we call chaos it has its own order whatever what inspired um, the pattern on the bottom I think I felt like this was a, a vessel of some kind. And there's a beautiful section at the Met of old Etruscan uh, tombs. And they're, they're just really crudely patched lines in like a sepia tone. But there's something just gorgeous about that. And who knows why the first person ever did that, you know? It's like those cave paintings with seven dots on a wall and nobody knows why they're there. But you can see that's not, a natural formation because of the the configuration of the dots you know that there was an idea there of what we call ideas it's some human human thing to make that mark and not just you know a mark created by a drip it's two different things so one has intention even if the intention isn't really known it's in there somewhere so I feel like that kind of influences there the mark the patterns those what we call primitive are actually I mean, you look at them and they're in Matisse, they're in cave paintings, they're in Etruscan tombs. People just return to this idea of making a pattern for some reason. I guess it's like talking or something. Pablo's pants. <laughs> I mean, I had a, uh, like everybody, who doesn't know who Pablo is, right? If you're in the art, art, but uh, that cut, when I made that cut, I just put it on a piece of wood. I'm like, oh, wow, well, there it is, you know? the screaming woman from Guernica, you know, <laughs> or those drawings from that period. It was just so obvious. And then this chunk was upstate. So I got this guy and I, when I saw it, I thought I need that piece of wood. I need that fork, you know, because it was just such a beautiful fork. And then the head on top of that was, that was just what happened. And I, I earlier, as some of you have seen, I had painted the base because they don't normally have a base. They sit outside. But this place is so great because Jess was like, well, we need to make sure they don't fall over on anybody. So <laughs> that kind of presented a challenge and also showed me some things about the process that makes sculpture a really fun exercise, which is balance and figuring out a way to like something that's so hundreds of pounds can be balanced with a with a wedge that's like a few inches, you know. Um, I just had a splinter taken out of my hand that was one inch long. I'm like six foot, 200 pounds. One tiny piece of wood makes me miserable, you know. One tiny wedge holds this whole thing up. So um, fixing that kind of stuff, and this is now really secure on here. Oops, sorry. I have to take this call. I'll be right back. Um, yeah, I don't know. This guy just like, and then when I, so I don't know. The teeth they kept falling out, so now they're implants, and uh, I have some surgeries lined up for the rest of the issues. There's some missing limbs and whatnot, but uh, no, I feel like it's as a form. I had at one point painted this as brick because I thought it was funny and I was trying to resolve how do I deal with this base because it's become such a part of it. And Jess was like, ah, I don't know. And I thought, because when I did it, I was like, this is either a huge mistake or maybe it helped. But the more I looked at it, the more I thought, ah, I don't know. So I really felt like I was in unknown territory, but everybody else is like, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't seem, because what happens for me is I cut and then I paint. And that was, there was nothing cut to paint. And it was somehow fake. 
uh, or superficial, not fake, but superficial. And so returning it to a base put life back into the up into the structure itself. So I feel like that was sometimes it's good to take the advice of friends. <laughs> I remember Lucian Freud, there's a story about him. Francis Bacon invited him to his studio and he said, well, you know, I'm working on this painting, what do you think? And Freud just said, I don't know, do you really want those guys to look like parking cones? <laughs> and so Bacon scrapped the painting. Um, so I scrapped the bricks and I think it's better for it. You can always put them back. Yeah, but... Um. <clears throat> I want to ask you just um, about the decision to use this old willow stump as the placement for this piece. Well, and yeah, so like the work and the environment and how that all kind of works together, this property is so gorgeous because like that stump was there. I originally had that cloud piece on another stump because trees are composed in a lot of these landscapes. like. The placement of this cleared this tree at some time cleared this whole area because of its shade and now it's a ruin so this is kind of like a, a monument to that tree in some way and i like the fact that it's on that thing as a kind of monument to it as as a monument to the to the crumbling natural form that once was this towering incredible thing it just really appeals to me so as a thing it sort of felt like it was paying respect to the previous owner of the spot, like that. So this one is called Stack Cluster, and it's kind of a a cluster of stacks. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, some of these these are all kind of uh, amputations or something from other pieces. And for instance, this was at one time a 15 foot tall three-legged thing and uh, it lost its legs and you know one of them is in here somewhere um, other pieces are were in other configurations and when I started to think about this kind of outdoor space I thought my god how will I hold that space you know with the piece and uh, I knew that I had these but they were in different places like one of them was just it had its own singularity and its own strange line to it. And I thought when you combine all those, it gets really crazy and dynamic. Like I, I really enjoyed photographing this thing because I love seeing these patterns and these lines kind of going in their own way, wherever you look at it. And with, again, they were in a field, you know, like one popping up. It started looking like worms though, just not working. So then I, I thought, well, I need to secure them, so I need to put them on something. And then it occurred to me, oh, the square creates a little mini cityscape by itself. I don't have to do anything. And, and the stabilization was, I was telling someone earlier, one of the satisfying things about working in sculpture is when something balances, you know, something that looks chaotic, but it's, it's held by gravity which is the force of, of this whole universe, you know? And so these things were stable, but they needed to be locked in. And so they became like pieces in a board game. When I put these pedestals on them and then mounted them here, then the whole thing just snapped together in its own way. And that's why I like the fact that it's not level because there's nothing level anywhere in that piece. You will not find one square line. But the suggestion of right angles is there so it's kind of a joke on itself you know there's this this order and chaos in the same frame happening which is really appealing and decay and growth and you know all those elements i really like seeing that because i feel like that's such a part of what we are just decaying and growing all the time so i like the word cluster too <laughs> suggest other words that could follow you know sort of the way we live you know we're in a cluster you know? we're doing things with the cluster <laughs> and our sense of order is also a joke human order is a joke i don't know one rational human being and everybody talks about rationality they don't exist so it's kind of a great joke on rationality and logic logic is a cluster dot 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 this is an arm 
And um, I, I don't know, I just, again, it was a piece that balanced and I had, a, a, it was like a, a piece that was there and then it balanced and then I just saw this kind of, it looks like a brushwork to me, almost in wood. It's not really a, so then when I, when I got this, fortunately Rylan, who um, sweetly saw that uh, when they were cutting down the, the telephone pole in front of my house, they, she said, no, don't throw that away, please leave that. And I have these great telephone poles. And I, again, there's a circle and a square, and then this thing, which is an arm. And I like the word, I don't know, language is a funny thing. Arm, armed, disarmed, dismembered, uh, limb, it's from a tree limb, limb from limb. <laughs> I'm gonna tear you limb from limb. Uh, we've all heard that at some point or another, um, or not. And uh, I don't know, I just, uh, it's a funny piece because I also think these things are like a monument. You know, when you're working, all this stuff goes through your brain about what you're doing and why you're doing it and who's done it before and why do you do a monument? And, and I feel like monuments are usually Historically, they're monuments to a great hero or a war or to something. And this is kind of a monument to the, uh, similar to the other one, I guess, and sort of throughout the work, I feel like this idea of uh, ideology as a beautifully poetically failed uh, attempt at humans to get some sense of order in a chaotic universe, you know? And so it's kind of my little poem to that. That's all. A monument to I don't know what we're doing here. <laughs> but we have arms. Yeah. I like where you placed this one too. It's a nice little spot. Yeah. It has its own little company of pals yeah, that's here. Right. Yeah. Of yeah. arms. Yeah. And limbs. Limbs. <laughs> Many limbs. It was the dots of this again about pat patterns you were talking You know, about. I really I started when I got these poles, I I painted dots on them and it was like I was I was remembering that cave because I, you know, I was having this conversation with Jess about the difficulties of the art world and marketing and the, the value placed on art and how like, and I always remember once going to a cave in, in Spain and they have the, there were the dots on the wall in this cave. And you're standing on a dirt floor that 30,000 years ago, some human being with the same basic equipment that I have did this thing on a wall. Like why? And dots, why is that appealing? Why is it when you make a series of dots that somehow for me is just something really beautiful about it? And so it's dots. And I think, I think it works because I don't know why. <laughs> but it just seems right that um, it's kind of an homage to that sensation. It's like the pattern that someone was asking about, or how do I get to the pattern? It's like, I don't know, I just, I don't know why we do that, but you know, one of the first things humans also painted was a grid, and they used to call them a trap. So what does that mean? Is it a trap? Is it a you know? Is it a key to something larger? Is it a, a, a an enclosure? It's either one or both. I don't know. So that's why. It's, but I, I, they're appealing. Somehow. And that's it. Seven pieces. Seven magic seven. Well, thank you guys. Thank you so much for coming. It's really nice to talk to you guys.